Hello, everyone. My name is Meredith Hooper. I'm one of the co-directors of the Caltech Project for Effective Teaching. And I'd like to welcome you all today to Dr. Lulu Tian's talk. So Dr. Tian is a professor in bioengineering. And she is this year's recipient of the Feynman Prize for Excellence in Teaching. So we're very excited to welcome her and uh, hear her talk today. Hi, everyone. So today, I will tell you about my class on design and construction of programmable molecular systems. And this class is offered um, to undergraduates and early year graduate students in mainly in bioengineering and computer science. And I designed this class in a way that it requires minimum background. So whether you consider yourself a computer scientist who never used a pipette before, or a bioengineer a bioengineer who never developed a computer program before, as long as you're interested in the behaviors of biomolecules and applying computer science principles to molecular engineering, you might do very well in this class. And this class is a design and build class. So it has two student design competitions. And the winner designs will be constructed in the wet lab. So I will tell you some examples later in this talk. Now, if you take the class, it will introduce you to a molecular engineering research frontier that is interdisciplinary and unconventional. You will learn how to design molecular devices in a way that is systematic, almost like how you write a computer program. And you will learn ways to debug a molecular system that you designed and practice your detective skills. So what motivated me to develop this class is to share my view of the world. Some objects are classified as matter and others as life. However, it is hard to define a strict line between them. More likely, there appears to be a gap between the two only because of what currently exists. Once the gap is filled, the spectrum could be continuous. At that point, we will be able to explain how life could arise from a collection of lifeless molecules and to engineer various forms of matter with desired mixtures of life and non-life-like properties. So to explore the space between matter and life, let us think about their similarities and differences. Biology provides ample examples of life forms from four billion years of evolution on Earth. And each of them can be seen as a molecular program, where information encoded in molecules determines how they perform a task, not unlike how information encoded in silicon determines how a computer program runs. And the kinds of tasks matter can perform, which can be thought of as the design space, depends on the nature of the substrate. When a technology is mature, the design space can be impressively rich. There are over 1.3 billion lines of code in computer programs are being produced every day. So presumably, the design space of possible molecular programs is vastly larger than the design space occupied by existing examples. Synthetic biology has allowed some explorations of this design space, but our understanding of molecular programs is far less complete than computer programs. Yet, matter built from biomolecules will allow for capabilities more powerful than silicon-based computers, such as to replicate, grow, heal, learn, adapt, and evolve. So engineering this new type of matter, also known as programmable molecular machines, is key to closing the gap between matter and life. Now that chemistry has advanced to the point that biomolecules such as nucleic acids and peptides with custom sequences can be designed and synthesized, the substrate of life has become available as a substrate for programmable matter. In the past few decades, many synthetic structures and devices made of DNA have emerged. For example, 
synthetic membrane channels made of DNA can insert themselves into lipid bilayers. And the size, as well as the opening and closing of the channels, can be programmed to control the gating of molecules. Another type of device, also made of DNA, can be programmed to sense specific combinations of biomolecules in the environment and subsequently open up capsule or barrel-like structures to release molecular payloads. One can also fold DNA into positioning devices and measure the force between molecules of interest, such as nucleosomes. Now, from the examples of programmable molecular systems that students will learn in my class, they will see that chemistry and computer science perspectives have grown strongly connected into one grand vision. Information-bearing biomolecules provide the ideal substrate for a new type of programmable matter, which will eventually enable powerful and embedded control within chemistry, medicine, and materials. So the goal of my class is for students to design and build their own DNA circuits and self-assemble DNA nanostructures. You might have had the following experience when doing research. Everything works until it stops working. And I prefer a different experience, where things don't quite work, but you collect understandings like jigsaw pieces, until one day we figure out how the pieces come together, leading to a beautiful ending. The second journey can be quite a bit longer, but also quite a bit more interesting and meaningful than the first. So in the class, my lectures include detective stories about debugging DNA circuits and nanostructures. And the students are graded not by how many things they get to work, but by how many jigsaw pieces that they collect. So the spirit of this class is somewhat similar to the movie Inception, if you have seen it. The movie is about planting an idea into someone's mind. So they think it's their own idea. And it is done by invading the person's mind through dreams. So there's a target whose mind you plant the idea into. There's an idea which is simple enough that you can successfully embed it into the person's subconsciousness. Then you need an architect who design the plot of the dream. Finally, you need some kind of sedative which can, be put your, which can be used to put your target to sleep. So in reality, if you fall asleep and have a dream, you're being level one. If you have a dream within a dream, you go to level two. And you can go deeper and deeper. If you take a general sedative, you can wake up by a kick, for example, losing gravity or die. But a general sedative could only bring you down to level one and two. So if you want to plant a more sophisticated idea into someone's subconsciousness, you have to go deeper, which requires a strong sedative. The problem of the strong sedative is that you could still wake up to one level up by a kick, but if you die, you drop to limbo. Limbo is not a dream designed by any architects. One has no idea what it looks like before you get there. And then you have a great risk of losing your memories so you will think limbo is reality and stay there for many, many years, unless you somehow figure out the truth and commit suicide. And then uh, that will bring you back to reality. Another thing is that dreams happen faster than reality. 10 hours in reality gives you one week in level one, six months in level two, 10 years in level three, et cetera. So in my class, the target is DNA molecules. The idea that we want to plant or program into the DNA molecule's behavior is that I'm a logic gate, a neuron, or a tile. And the students in the class are the architects. The sedative that we use is TE magnesium, that is a buffer, uh, that puts DNA to sleep and start dreaming. So in reality, we know that DNA is a genetic material. At level one, it will perform strand displacement, which I will explain shortly. At level two, it will carry out signal amplification 
and restoration. At level three, it will start to act like a logic gate, an artificial neuron, or a tile. At level four, it will exhibit system level behaviors like logic circuit, an artificial neural network, or a tile array. At level five, it will participate in sophisticated tasks including molecular pattern recognition or reconfiguration. And in all of these levels, DNA is no longer a genetic material, but an engineering material and computing substrate. And of course, there is also a place called limbo, where your designed dream world goes wrong, and the DNA molecules start doing things that we don't understand. So T magnesium is a strong sedative. So you may only wake up and return to a previous level by a kick. A kick here means being able to compile from a high-level abstraction to low-level molecular implementation, which I will explain shortly. And that your simulation successfully explains your experimental data. So you could also die by having completely failed experiments that indicate design flaws. In that case, you will stay in limbo for a while until you figure out the reasons behind the failed experiments and redesign all the DNA molecules accordingly. And we have a similar time difference here. In reality, um, as a genetic material, DNA is transcribed at a rate of 25 nucleotides per second in E. coli. In a single strand displacement reaction, it takes place within minutes if we have 100 nanomolar concentration. But increasingly complex systems will, uh, with reaction cascades will take hours to reach completion state. And in limbo, figuring out the reasons behind the failed experiment could well take weeks to months. And occasionally, the mystery is never solved, and that particular molecular system will stay in limbo forever. OK, now let's jump into how to design and build molecular circuits. DNA strands can, perform, uh, can form a double helix if their sequences match, meaning A pairs with T and C pairs with G. And each strand can be represented as a colored line with an arrowhead marking its orientation. A continuous subset sequence of uh, nucleotides can work as a functionally independent unit, which is called a domain. For example, S1T and S2, shown here, are three different domains. Star indicate Watson-Crick complementarity. For example, S1 star is complementary to S1. Now, because each domain can be assigned with different sequence choices, one can first only pay attention to the domains during the process of designing a DNA circuit and then design sequences at a later point. The mechanism that we use to program interactions between DNA molecules is called toehold mediated strand displacement. A toehold is a short domain of typically three to seven nucleotides. A branch migration domain is a longer domain of typically 15 to 20 nucleotides. A single strand can displace another strand and form a double-stranded complex with the help of a toehold domain. So the single strand first binds to the double-stranded complex by the uncovered toehold. Then branch migration occurs because the S domains on both molecules are identical. So they compete for binding to the S star domains. And this happens one base pair at a time, back and forth in a random walk until the originally bound strand dissociates from the complex, replaced by the invading strand. This animation shows the dynamic process. The invading strand has a toehold, here colored in red, which binds to the complementary red domain hanging off from the double helix, starting a competition with a blue strand. And base pairs are being opened and closed very quickly, moving back and forth until the blue strand is released and the veiling strand now becomes part of a double helix. A simple DNA gate motif was previously designed for building logic circuits. The input strand first binds to the gate output complex by the toehold, displace the S5 domain, and the output strand will unbind from the gate strand when it is only attached to the short, by the short toehold. At this point, you see that the input becomes fully bound to the gate with a toehold on the right side of the gate strand exposed. Now, if there's a free fuel strand, it can bind to the open toehold, displace the same S5 domain, 
and the input strand will unwind. Because after each cycle, the input strand is always free to trigger the release of another output. So a small amount of input can catalyze the release of a large amount of output while consuming the same amount of fuel. This is an experimental demonstration of a DNA catalyst with the help of a reporter molecule that converts the output signal to fluorescence. Now, if we plot the level of outputs at 60 minutes as a function of the input, the circuit clearly performs signal amplification because the input produced more output than the amount of input itself. In addition to activating the output, the input can also be consumed by a threshold molecule. It binds to the threshold via a longer toehold, and the displacement reaction only produces waste product that cannot react with any other molecules. The threshold of reaction is much faster than output production, and thus only when all threshold molecules have been fully consumed can the output be actively, uh, effectively activated. So this experiment demonstrates that thresholding works in practice, because when you look at um, the experiment with 0.5x threshold molecules and the input strand were varied from one, 0 to 1x, the data shows a clean off state when the input is smaller than 0.5 and a clean on state when the input is greater than 0.5, which is important for converting noisy analog signals to digital signals in logic circuits. A principle from computer science is that it is much easier to design complex systems at a higher level and neglect the lower level details. For example, it is much easier to design logic circuits with logic gates rather than with directly with transistors. This principle was applied to DNA circuit design, in which each DNA gate is represented with a two-sided node, and each signal strand is represented with a wire that connects two different sides of two nodes. Red numbers on a wire or within a node can be used to indicate identities of DNA molecules as well as their initial concentrations. For example, a negative number within a node indicates a threshold molecule because it consumes input. Okay, with this abstraction, we can start composing the nodes together to make a logic gate. We assume the signals are never perfect, which is the case for molecules. The logic off state could be anywhere between 0 and 0.2, and the logic on state could be anywhere between 0.8 and 1. One node can be used to compute the sum of both inputs. A second node can be used to calculate if the sum is greater than 0.6 or not. When both inputs are off, the sum should be less than 0.6. Thus, the output should stay off. When one of the inputs is on, the sum should exceed the threshold, and thus an ideal output should be produced to reach the on value. And to implement this design, a set of DNA molecules corresponding to the abstraction were created and mixed together in the test tube. We can see from the data, even with imperfect inputs, the outputs reached a clear on and off states. And similarly, we can change the threshold from 0.6 to 1.2 to make an AND gate. In this case, only when both inputs are on, can the sum exceed the threshold and catalyze the output to be on. A DNA circuit compiler was developed to automatically translate a user-designed logic circuit into a DNA circuit, generate DNA sequences for constructing the circuit, and simulations for predicting the molecular circuit's behavior. Using this compiler, it became possible to have a DNA circuit design competition in my class. This is an example design competition. Students were asked to design an interesting logic circuit using up to six logic gates with a few other constraints about the number of inputs, outputs, gate types, and layers. And here's a winner design by Chris Sarchuk in spring 2015, voted by all the students in the class. He designed a logic circuit that computes two one-dimensional cellular automata transition rules. Each rule can be illustrated with a set of eight input and output combinations, where zero and one are represented with white and black pixels, respectively. 
L, C, and R correspond to the left, center, and right input pixels. The output pixel corresponds to the updated state of the center pixel determined by the three inputs. Okay, if we start with a uh, string of binary numbers 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, arranged in a one-dimensional grid, and apply rule 110 to compute the second row of pixels. For example, 0, 0, 0 yields 0, 0, 0, 1 yields 1, 0, 1, 0 yields 1, 1, 0, 0 yields 0, and etc. The first generation outputs will be produced, which then become inputs for the next row. If we continue doing this for eight generations, an image of a dog will emerge. <laughs> if we start with the same initial configuration but apply a different rule, it's called rule 124, a mirror image dog will emerge. A fun fact. Rule 110 is famously known to be Turing universal, which means it can compute any desired functions. When Chris presented this design in class, he told a story of when Rule 124 meets Rule 110. The story was very memorable, probably a good reason that he won the design competition. Next, using the DNA circuit compiler, the logic circuit was converted to a DNA circuit together with simulations that verified the desired circuit behavior. And students in the class then worked together to construct the DNA circuit. This effort was led by Anu Subagiri, who was their head TA. This was the first data they uh, obtained for constructing a signal restoration circuit. And a mystery was that the output was not sufficiently on when the input was greater than the threshold which is different from what the simulation predicted. So they came up with a hypothesis that maybe the real concentration of the threshold molecule was different from the assumed concentration because the DNA strands that were used in the class were unpurified and thus may contain synthesis and stoichiometry errors. So they further came up with a solution to estimate the real effective concentration of the threshold by comparing simulation with experiment. Simulation suggested that a 40% higher concentration would explain the experimental observation. So we didn't purify the molecules because the purification procedure is both time consuming and labor intensive, which is not suitable for students with no prior background. If DNA circuits could be built from unpurified components, the experimental procedure would be much simplified, making DNA circuits more accessible to researchers with diverse backgrounds. And motivated by this challenge, the team developed a systematic procedure for constructing DNA circuits using unpurified components. And thanks to their work, it is now possible to follow a flowchart that identified the main issues that one might encounter and proceed with suggested solutions in a systematic way. Now, let there be dogs. The ideal logic circuit behavior corresponds to images of black dogs with white backgrounds. And the DNA circuit yielded less contrast between the dogs and their backgrounds. But you can tell that the patterns are still clearly recognizable. OK, next, let's talk about how to design and build self-assembled molecular structures. DNA origami was invented by Paul Rotemund here at Caltech. Using this technique, DNA can be folded into any desired shapes. In this conceptual animation, a long single-stranded DNA is colored in yellow. It is typically called a scaffold strand. And many short DNA strands colored in blue here are designed to fold the long strands into any desired shape. These short strands are commonly referred to as staple strands. And each short strand binds to two or more different locations on the scaffold strand and holds these locations together like a staple. And a large number of staple strands each occupies a unique position in the shape. And they co collectively bind to the scaffold strand in a self-assembly process to form the designed shape. 
Molecular machines made of modular reconfigurable components may be the basis for dynamic self-reprogramming in future synthetic cells. At least that's one of my dreams. So let us envision an artificial cell whose membrane is made of hundreds to thousands of DNA origami tiles. Each tile has a distinct circuit attached to the outer or inner side of the membrane, such that the global function of the cell signaling process is determined by the connectivity of the circuits through neighboring tiles. And a tile can dynamically replace another tile to alter both the structure and the computation of the artificial cell. So to achieve dynamical interactions between DNA origami tiles, a mechanism called tile displacement was invented. An invader tile binds to an open domain in a two-tile complex, and subsequent branch migration occurs when two tile edges com compete for binding to their complementary edge until the previously bound tile is released. The complementarity between tiles can be encoded in both the shapes of the tile edge and the DNA sequences of short sticky ends. And five years ago, Fulop and Greg showed that tile displacement can take place at any desired locations within a DNA origami tile assembly in any desired order, as illustrated in this nanoscale tic-tac-toe game. Philip also developed a compiler that converts any user-supplied image to DNA strands and wet lab protocols. A liquid handling robot could then follow the protocol to assist the construction of the DNA origami tiles and arrays. With this compiler, it became possible to have another design competition in my class. Here, students were asked to design a tile array using up to seven types of square tiles and four types of edge interactions, and invaders that reconfigure the tile array into a different shape. Here's a winning design by Kellen Rodriguez in winter 2021. He used four types of tiles and three types of edge interactions to assemble into a seven-tile sword-shaped array. By adding patterns to the tiles, the array resembles a sword quite well. He also designed two invaders. One looks like a snake tail. Another looks like a snake head. And together, the two invaders reconfigure the sword into a snake. The construction of the winning design was led by Namata Surev, who was a TA of the class. And this is an atomic force microscopy image of the sort DNA tile array that they constructed. However, there's a mystery. We saw a fair amount of incomplete structures and aggregations. For example, a noticeable population of incomplete structures is one-armed sort which are highlighted in those orange boxes. You can see quite a few of them. So Namata and Kellen come up with a hypothesis that one of the tiles, S1, had a self-occluding edge that might have resulted in reversible dimerization of tile S1, and thus prevented tile S3 from fully incorporating into the sword. So what does that mean? Self-occlusion occurs when the staple extension sequences on a tile edge matches the staple sequence itself, allowing two copies of the same tile to reversibly form dimers by a sparse branch migration at the strand level between all pairs of staples along the tile edge. And with this hypothesis, Namata and Kellen then redesigned to, uh, the array to avoid self-occluding edges. And indeed, now you see that atomic force microscopy images of the revised design showed fewer incomplete structures and aggregations. There were quite a few other interesting mysteries that I don't have time to tell you about today, but I hope you now have an idea about why you need to be an architect and a detective to play Inception in a molecular world. Okay, but I will show you some experimental data on reconfigured molecular structures. When only the head invader was present, atomic force microscopy images showed two products. One is a snake head reconfigured into the sword blade, and the other 
um, is they displace the handle of the sword. And you also see some unreacted swords that were observed in the images. When only the tail invader was present, atomic force microscopy images showed two different products. One is a snake tail reconfigured onto the sword handle, and the other is the displaced blade of the sword. And in this case, there was nearly no unreacted sword. When the head and tail invaders were both present, all three products, snake, handle, and blade, as well as intermediates, were observed. So what can molecules do? The answers must be endlessly fascinating. I hope my class will continue to provide a place for students from diverse backgrounds to come together and explore these answers. And apparently, actually, my, short, my talk is much shorter than I expected. So thank you. That's a story I wanted to tell you. Now we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, thank you. This is a like, really fascinating talk. Uh, I just have like a kind of, kind of naive question. It's like so when you show like the end or or gate, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering like is the results like a little bit probabilistic? Like it's like you're, you're seeing like one is you can adjust like be, you get like something not one or zero but somewhere in between. Is that like is that probabilistic or not? Like I have no background in this field, so like I mean. That's a good question. Yeah. So if you think about individual molecules that they bump into each other, and then it is definitely the case that there's going to be some kind of probabilistic behavior or stochastic behavior. However, the thing I didn't mention here is that when we do the experiments, they're not at the single molecule level. You have a test tube where you have billions of molecules all together free floating around. So even though each molecule could produce a stochastic behavior, the collection of all the molecules, when you observe the behavior in bulk, it's actually deterministic. So when you saw that the on is not 100% on and the off is not 100% off, that's because of the intrinsic noise in molecular systems. Because molecules don't function perfectly as what they're designed to do. So they create, let's say, some signal decay would occur if a molecule is supposed to generate a signal but it failed to, or you can have a slightly uh, a higher off state Oh, because of some molecules that they're not supposed to react, but nonetheless, when they bump into each other, they yield a product that is undesired. And because of those kind of spurious interactions, you're never going to get very clean on and off behavior. And that's why it was actually very important for us to building the signal restoration in the system. So even if the uh, natural behavior of the molecular system is even more noisier than what you saw in the experimental data, they got cleaned up into a reasonably well, well on and off states. So I'm, I'm going to like just ask like a follow-up. This is just like a, I mean, I'm from a physics background, so I'm just going to say like, do you think there's any connection with this to quantum computing? Like, it's like you have like many systems where you measure the means, you know, kind of, you do get a behavior in the mean, but it's also like probabilistic in some degree. So do you think, you know, just there might be any like connection to that? If you're interested in that, I would recommend you talk to David Soloveitchik at UT Austin. He was a graduate student here at Caltech, but now he studies both molecular computing and quantum computing. He will have very great insights about the similarities and differences between the systems. I'm not an expert in quantum computing, so I'm not able to answer this question, but that's it. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the, the programs that you built are obviously very cool, but there is like a, a historical architect, right? Natural selection. Do you guys find any of these? I mean, these programs are really nice, right? But we have built them. Did, when they came up with these toeholds, are there toeholds that they see in nature? Because also in nature, the DNA has to compete with proteins in terms of programming interaction, right? Do you see these DNA programs or protein programs in cells? That's also a great question. I would say that many people were fascinated by that question. I was, was trying to look for the mechanism of toehold mediated strand displacement in biology. But 
to this day, I would say that the answer is not clear. And because of how simple they are, you definitely see molecules, like RNA molecules, especially small RNA molecules, right? They are similar to the size of the DNA molecules I showed here. So it's totally conceivable they undergo this um, toehold immediate strand displacement process, especially some, hy some people hypothesis to that, that maybe it actually play a role in the transcription process when the RNA molecules is transcribed, and then it first falls into some kind of secondary structures, but then the secondary structures got altered when you start having strand displacement. So those were hypotheses out there and were pursued, and I don't think there are clear evidence about that yet, but that's a great question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, so for the uh, DNA circuits that you talked about and the parallel between the analog circuit, uh, the digital gates that you showed, and I know there was mention of quantum computing before, I was wondering if you could shed some light about <clears throat> on what might be some potential applications of these DNA circuits outside of biology and uh, you know, biological computations. Yes. So one of the interesting things that people have explored uh, as an application for DNA circuits is disease diagnostics. So in that case, you can imagine that if you have a patient sample that contain a number of um, uh, gene expression levels that compose a disease profile, and then that sample can be used to function as input. So you can design, for example, there are these molecules called aptamers. They can sense other type of molecules, whether it's nucleic acids or not. You can use the aptamers to translate a different type of molecular signal into DNA signal, such that you will have an interface. Even though the DNA circuit is fully, com fully composed of DNA molecules, it can accept other types of molecules as both inputs and outputs. There's also research have been done that the output of a DNA circuit can be used to, to activate, for example, a protein production. So those are many ways that you can create an interface for these DNA circuits, such that their applications are not limited to the sensing and computing and driving downstream behaviors that are limited to um, nucleic acid molecules. So molecular diagnostics is one of the um, currently well-developed research area because you can imagine that it doesn't require those circuits to function in cells. But if you want to think about a biomedical application such as therapeutics, then that's more challenging because now you need these molecular circuits to actually function in a cellular environment. And you can imagine that the natural biological environment might not really like these synthetic circuits. So there are also things being explored there. For example, if we can imagine that I talked about um, a DNA origami structure, and I showed a brief example where the DNA origami can fold into like a capsule structure. So you can imagine that if you chemically modify the capsule so that they are more um, tolerant in a biological environment, then you can put the molecular circuits inside the capsule so that they can be protected in order to function in a biological environment. And again, those are things that are actively being pursued in the field, but I don't think I can say that you can see immediate applications that has uh, the level of impact we would like to see in the future yet. Um, hi, great talk. Uh, I'm interested in the microscopy images that you showed um, because I guess uh, if I understood it correctly, these are like uh, three-dimensional nucleic acids that you're imaging. And so like, for example, the swords, if you were to take an image of a sword uh, kind of down its long axis, you would just see a line. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious that in your images, you, you tend to typically see like these uh, swords. And I'm wondering like how, how do they orient themselves uh, when you image them? Actually, the images I showed, they're on the surface. So uh, they're two-dimensional images. So what happened in that particular technique is called atomic force microscopy. You create a mica surface, and then the DNA molecules can land on the surface. So then when you have the buffer, it will serve as a glue to fix the molecules on the surface with a little bit of diffusion, but they're mostly fixed on the surface so that you can image the two-dimensional structures really well. If you want to image three-dimensional structures, then you need a different type of microscopy experiment. And since we designed those arrays are flat structures, so we mostly use AFM as a mechanism to look at the molecules. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question about 
like uh, you mentioned the application maybe for the disease diagnosis. So have you ever collaborated with any uh, hospitals or with other patients? And uh, have you show that uh, how the uh, significance of your research? No, I have not. Uh, <laughs> and uh, do you have any such future plan? No, I don't have any future plans to pursue applications. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, what I'm really curious about is a question about design space. What is possible? So DNA molecules really give you, because they're a very programmable molecule, so they are a really a very nice engineering substrate for us to answer many of the fundamental questions about what can molecules possibly do. So if you think about this, when Alan Turing invented the electronic computers, he could not possibly have predicted all the applications that today occurred about silicon computers. But what he did was to provide a general purpose computational tool so that others can use that tool to explore a variety of applications. So similarly, my interest is to develop the general purpose tool for molecular programmable systems so that other researchers in the field can take what we've developed and explore a wide range of things that they are interested in. And that is what I believe I'm most interested in and what I'm good at. And I will be really bad at pursuing applications. That's another reason why I don't do it. Then how do you show that your model or your result is accurate? Well, because the question we're asking is simple. We're asking, uh, can the design behavior be observed in a clean test tube environment? So that's why this we can't answer definitely by doing the simple experiments I showed. You can look at it on using a microscope. You, you can look at it using a fluorescent assay. And those answers we can do. But again, if you think about applications, it goes beyond a simple clean test tube environment. So those behaviors, you have to start um, asking all of those questions that are relevant for a particular application in order to adapt the design of your system to fit those particular applications. So that's not the questions that I'll be able to answer either in my research lab or in this class, because my class really focused on exploring what is the design space. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering, when you're designing the DNA tiles, what types of properties are you trying to endow it with? Sorry, could you repeat that? When you're designing a DNA tile, what are the properties that you're endowing the DNA tile with in order to design it? What are the properties we are? Like how exactly, or what are the principles of designing a DNA tile? Ah, okay, what is the principles? Yes, that's a great question. I skipped a bunch of the details. So uh, if you want to design DNA tiles that self-assemble into an array structure, then what matters is you need to the shape to, to be uh, um, possible to fit in a two-dimensional array. So square is one of the options, right? So if you know that you want the shape to be a square, then there are a number of ways that you can use a software tool that you can root the scaffold strand to fill in the shape of the square. And then the software tool would help you to design the staple strand that hold the scaffold strand together into the shape. So the number one step principle is you need to get the desired shape. And the second thing is that since they're tiles, the tiles are designed to interact with each other. So you need to pay attention to the edge design. So those are the DNA molecules, uh, strands that are uh, arranged on the exterior of the tile. And they have those very short sticky ends. So those sticky ends allow the tiles to interact with each other. And that's uh, the interaction we must think about. And in the example I showed, it's not just forming an array, but forming an array that can reconfigure from one shape to another. And when you think about that, a third design principle is important is about the flexibility of the structure. Because now what we need is for an invader tile to compete with an existing structure in a um, assembly and to replace that. So that means the dynamical process involves the molecules to fold up a little bit to get out of each other's way in order for that pro process of competition to take place. So flexibility is very important for the tile designs. That's why actually in the square tiles you see they're composed of four triangles and they're single-stranded domains connecting those triangles and those are the flexible regions in the tile so that they can actually bend a little bit out of the way when undergo the competition. So those are just a few example design principles we need to take pay attention to if we want the molecules to perform the desired task. I see, thank you so much. Sure. Hi, um, once again, th thanks for the great talk. Um, I wanted to ask something kind of just about the, the teaching context of the class. Um, of course, you mentioned one of the challenges was you know, different students coming from different backgrounds. Uh, I think another challenge is, as you mentioned, 
um, a large part of the process is troubleshooting um, the like, you know, problems with the experimental design. So I wanna ask, like, how do you uh, decide how much help and how to provide that help to the students such that they're still learning to you know, troubleshoot on their own, but that you kind of provide, that you can provide resources when, when needed? Thank you for the question. So actually, I'm not sure that I can provide a lot of help for the students because the uh, winning design is usually a system that I've never seen before, right? So we have a lot of unknowns, intrinsically unknowns, when the students try to build their design structures. Sure, maybe we have more experience doing this kind of research so we can provide better insights, but it is important, I believe, one um, interesting aspect of this class is for students to build their own designs. So to explore this process like uh, using the eyes of the detective to look at these molecules so that they can understand the system they designed. So if we give too much instructions, then the students won't have ex that experience. But of course, if we give too little help to the students, they might get stuck, and because the, the class is only 10 weeks, so you're not gonna learn a lot. But one thing I found that is, um, uh, that is really interesting in between is that I have student presentations in the class. So they present as a group. They talk with each other about the questions they had. And then when they present in the class, they give inspiration to other students about how they looked at their design, look at their data, and how they interpreted that data. So it's like a group of detectives working together is better than just one mind, right? So in that case, we can provide less guidance and let the students come up with their own uh, hypothesis and then come up with their own uh, solutions to test the hypothesis. So one element in all of our homework assignment is that whenever you look at the data, you should look at specifically about the difference between the simulation and the data, and then come up with a hypothesis to explain the difference. And then when you have a hypothesis, there are typically two ways you can um, verify whether the hypothesis is a true or false. One is that you can change your simulation. If you had a hypothesis, then you can simulate what your hypothesis is and then see if that matches experimental data. A second useful tool is that you can design a debugging experiment. So if this is true, then you have a different condition, you will see a different output, right? So you can design debugging experiments. So that's an element for every homework assignment. Students always uh, come up with a hypothesis and, and, uh, and come up with the solutions to validate their hypothesis. And I found that a particularly fun part of the class. Hello, thank you again for the amazing talk. It was really inspiring. Um, I guess I had a question about like the 3D structures that you could build and like different like transportation devices. I guess what sort of parts of that have you explored? Like obviously it's harder to create a 3D structure compared to the tiles, but would there be any limitations when you're designing like the sticky ends of the tiles if you were ha if you have to like use a lot of them? Thank you for the question. So actually, it's surprisingly easy to extend the same principle from two-dimensional self-assembled DNA nanostructures to three-dimensional structures. At least conceptually, that is the case. So if you can fold DNA into a two-dimension, you can also imagine that the scaffold, if you root the scaffold in a three-dimensional space, because it's just a linear strand, that, so you can root it in the three-dimensional space. And then you can design space staples to bind to multiple sites on the scaffold, again, with the rooted three-dimensional space. And they're supposed to come together and fold the molecules into a 3D structure. So this has been shown, and it applies exactly the same uh, design principle as a 2D structure. But one surprise is that it turns out when you need to fold the DNA molecules into a three-dimensional structure, it's more compact, right? So a thing that was kind of trivial that I was actually unsuccessful when I tried to first to fold the DNA origami into 3D, I was unsuccessful. But when I saw the successful research outcome, I realized the one key thing that happened there is that turns out you just need to give longer amount of time for the molecule to self-assemble. So the annealing process of heating it up and cooling it down took about a week instead of just a few hours for three-dimensional structures to form correctly. But nonetheless, the design principle was actually very similar. And then I have like a not so smart question. Um, I guess, does this mean you can play like 
three D video games with DNA molecules. Three <laughs> D video games. What do you mean by that? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, if I wanted a like a boat, and someone else has a three D molecular boat, then we can play games with each other. <laughs> <laughs> that actually gets into the area of molecular robotics. So this is one of my dream. I had always dreamed that one day, maybe in five years, I'll have a molecular robotic design competition in my class. And the research is not quite there. The reason is because when you want to build a robot, it both needs a three-dimensional structure to functioning as, let's say, the mechanical part to provide motions, and which we have done in the field. But you also need to have the DNA molecules to be able to uh, think and compute while they have these structural components. So it's, uh, molecular robotics really require an integration between both the DNA circuit part and the DNA structure part to come together. And there are additional challenges that's involved. So there are some progress. For example, a few years ago, my lab built a cargo sorting robot on the uh, DNA nanostructure surface. And these DNA molecules can randomly explore that surface and find a cargo molecule, pick it up, and based on the uh, sequences of the molecule, it's a tag attached to a fluorescent molecule. So it's like a, a, a zip code uh, in the molecular world. And then the robot recognizes that zip code and drop off the uh, cargo molecule at a desired destination. So that's one type of molecular robotic behavior. But we don't have a compiler yet. The problem is, you see that, what enabled my class is really those compiler tools. You can specify a high-level function, and it can be automatically translated to a DNA design. And that's what we are lacking in the world of molecular robotics today. We can build a particular system, but we can't build a general purpose molecular robotic system. So once that happens, it's an active uh, research direction my lab pursues. So once that happens, when we have a compiler that can give a user-defined mechanical motion to DNA sequences, then I will have a molecular robotic design competition in my class that day. All right, thank you so much. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm a freshman undergrad, which kind of explains a lot, I think. Um, if we were interested in taking your class, <laughs> what sort of requirements and like, I guess, like what years are usually in that class? There's no requirements. You no can requirements. take my class as a freshman. However, oh. I just recently discovered that technically you can't. The reason is because the class is full after the first couple of minutes when registration opens. <laughs> and freshman and sophomore has a half an hour delay when they can register for the class. But I don't like that. And I think it's important for someone who wants to explore this research area to be able to take the class early. So what I plan to do in future years, I'll figure out a way so that maybe, let's say, application-based, so that uh, we can have the students who are most interested in taking the class be able to do that, regardless of whether you're a freshman or a sophomore. Okay, thank you. <laughs> By the way, I did have uh, first year and sophomore taking my class when my class was not so popular, <laughs> when the slots were not gone. Okay, I think we're gonna take one more question. Thank you for the really nice talk. Um, I had a question on the teaching side. How do you think making it a competition versus just you know everyone presenting their projects um, affects how the students are motivated or how they think about it? Oh, you mean just each student have their own project and everyone do it? Oh, no, way? I just mean um, framing, framing the projects as a competition um, versus, I don't know, in some other class, you might just, everyone does their project, they come and present it at the end. Um, but do you think having it as sort of a competition with the reward of they actually get to try it out, um, do you think that helps motivate students or um, yeah, make it a more interesting class? Yeah, I hope so. Actually, one reason is because um, when it's a design competition, then every student gets to come up with their own idea. But we could only really experimentally do one design, because if every student does a different design, then that takes a lot more effort for the uh, TAs and me as an instructor to help the students navigate through the rest of the construction uh, of the research, right? So because if we have only one winner design, then the subsequent homework assignments are focused on questions just based on that design. So that all the students could, even though, because when they vote in the class, at least they liked their design to choose that as a winning design, right? So they, they were interested in uh, spending more time investigating about taking a wet lab journey to understand how the system can be built in the wet lab. It's just a practical issue, because then we can uh, arrange all the teaching process based on that one design. Thank you. One PM. Yes. 
Let's go ahead and thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.